Good afternoon. Today is Monday, November 21st, 2022. I am Pastor Crespo, the research librarian for the Bronx County Historical Society. I am joined by Rosalba Rolón, co-founder of Pregones and artistic director for the Pregones Puerto Rican Traveling Theater. Hello, Senora Rolón. Hello, Senor Crespo. Very <laughs> nice to meet you and thank you for this invitation. Thank you. It is a, it's a privilege and a sincere honor to be invited here today, you know, and thank you so much for taking time out of your, uh, your busy schedule. Uh, today, with our oral history, we want to focus on who is Rosalba Rolón. So uh, with that said, you know, I want to go ahead and go over something real quick. So you came to New York City as, as a young person in 1973, is that correct? Yes, well, actually, I was an adult already when I moved to, when I moved to New York. Uh, I had just finished college in Puerto Rico and uh, had an experience with uh, a graduate program that I, because I, 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 I finished young and I was immediately accepted into that program and it was a graduate program and, and uh, it was in combination with the City University of New York. And I had been to New York only once, you know, to a completely totally different context. And, I, I, you know, I, it was great. I came. We did the exchange of students, of Latino, especially at that time, mostly Puerto Rican students and students in Puerto Rico like myself. And I fell in love with the city. I went back to Puerto Rico, and then my life was, you know, I went into a, a new direction, and, and I ended up moving to New York shortly after I finished my master's. Wow, that, that's, that's so much for a young person, especially coming right out the university. And you did it. You went right out there in, yeah. in, into life. Uh, so looking upon Puerto Rico, where, where were you born in Puerto Rico? Where are you from? I was born in Comerio. Uh, actually, I was born in my grandparents' house, Calle Jose Vega, numero ocho in Comerio. <laughs> I always like to tell the address in case whoever is living there now will find me. <laughs> and um, Comerio is a beautiful, beautiful town. And my, and my, um, my father's, on my father's side from Comerio. And my mother is from Barranquita, okay. which is the town right after, you know, it's very close to, to Comerio. And I guess in those transits, that's how my dad and my mom met, you know, they found each other somehow. Uh, Mid Road, and and um, and I was born uh, into a very interesting family be, uh, of my father's side. In that, because they moved to Comerio, they were living right across the street from from my grandparents and all that. I was immersed into the Rolon part of the family way of life, um, and yeah. Okay, that's that's great. Uh, the only the, it was the actually interesting. Um, I I was there for for many years. I was the only girl. There's six cousins, all male, and myself, and then eventually my my younger, very younger cousin, uh, female, was born. So for a while, I had to fend myself with all of my male cousins, which was, uh, was great training for the rest of my life. <laughs> I agree. So no siblings. My brother. Okay. Yes, I have a wonderful brother. He lives in Virginia, um, and but also grew up in Puerto Rico. Most of his life was living there, um, and uh, his wife's um, um, job actually, you know, brought them to the United States, and they've been living in Virginia ever since. So I have my wonderful brother, and uh, yeah, that's great. And do you recall uh, the schools that you attended as far back as you can in Puerto Rico? Yes, because um, my elementary school was called Pedro H. Timoteo, Pedro H. Timoteo was my elementary school. And I remember it because my aunt, my, 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 um, my father's aunt, um, was a teacher there. And so they were determined that I start very early. So at four at four years old, I was already in first grade. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's why I finished school, finished high school at 17, entered university at 18. But, um, but it was great because um, it was, the school was embedded with all kinds of um, arts and literature and 
all kinds of things. I remember my childhood being very enriched by it, and I remember learning um, Italian and English and Spanish. It was just an immersion that was really wonderful. And uh, and and my entire, you know, my, my grandmother was, was a writer and had been an actress. I have a great story about my grandmother I may want to share. Okay. And, um, you know, and my, my aunt also used to write. So they were very, it was an environment that was very supportive of the creative spirits, really, yeah. Okay, and uh, mm -hmm. how about your high school before you went off to the university? Well, the high school, then when, when I actually was around fifth grade, my parents moved to uh, San Juan, uh, closer to, to the metropolitan area. So we left this small town, moved over, and then I attended uh, a different school, different middle school and high school, Margarita Hanel. Eventually we settled in the town of Guaynabo. And uh, at the Margarita Hanel, Hanel High School, is where they had a wonderful uh, theater program. But I want to say also that prior to that, in my uh, um, middle school, I went to the uh, Luis Pales Matos, which a school named after a great poet, Luis Pales Matos, and that I believe triggered a lot of my interest in the arts. Um, so at the time, during all of my childhood and my middle school and high school, there was a great program at the Department of Education at the university. It was called Arte para la Comunidad, or Arte y la Comunidad. And the idea was to, to make sure that artists would be working, coming to the schools. It was like an arts education program for the schools, but also our art that would go into the different communities, community centers and churches, and would do public programming throughout the year. And, and so that's when, I guess, you know, everything that, that my family had, had supported or, or, you know, enabled me to do as I was a little kid, as I began to, to um, play music and, and dance and since I was like eight, nine years old. So, so growing up in that supportive environment was wonderful. But uh, so I did move to eventually to uh, Guaynabo, which is another town next to San Juan. And that's when I went where I went to high school. Okay. What, what did your father do for a living? My father, very interesting. My father was an electrician. And my father used to do art with the lights. He was, had he been in another kind of environment or another life, he would have been a lighting designer. <laughs> but he, um, he would work with projects and uh, uh, projects, uh, electrical projects in, in big construction, co you know, with the construction companies. And but he specialized, for example, around Christmas time. I, I all I remember is we would have hardly see him because he was sought out by big buildings and beautiful stores for him to go and do the decor of the lights because okay. that was what he did best and he loved to do that. I have to say that he was a bit of a rebel as, and I adore my, grand, my, my paternal grand, grandparents, uh, but they, my, my grandfather was a, um, an hacendado, he had a hacienda, he had a big farm. And they were okay financially in the town and he was influential and he had expected for my father to follow and he was, my father was more of a rebel and I was like, I don't want to do that. I wanted to work with lights and I work with, you know, and he went into construction and it was like, what? <laughs> but he did what he loved to do. Uh, and, and so that's what, that, that's what he did uh, all his life. Uh, my mother was the, the, the conventional housewife who kept the family going and kept everything in check. <laughs> She's still with us, thank God. She lives with, with, with us. Um, and eventually, though, she also wanted to experience working outside of the home, and she found odd jobs here and there, and and I liked it, but not, not as much as she loved to. She loved to be in the house and not keeping everything organized. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's for sure. 
And uh, was uh, religion or spirituality a big part of your life in Puerto Rico? It was, it was the, the, I, I would say the regular, the regular things, you know, we would go to church, of course, in the, in the small town um, where we were. Eventually, my, my father turned a little bit, I don't know, was seduced by some of the evangelical stuff and we were, you know, dealing with, with all sorts of other religions. And I, I think I've been always an observer more than a practitioner. Um, so I do have respect for, of course, for, for uh, spiritual pursuits, but I don't practice a religion. Um, I just, I just think all religions are important, you know, and, but we do have to keep uh, our religious institutions in check because um, some unfortunate things have happened in the name of religion. And so we, that's why I, I'd rather stay outside of it but very respectful of those who practice it, obviously. Um, I have to I have to tell you this story about my grandmother. Please. And I'm sorry, I'm not, maybe you can edit this. This is what an oral history is about. So I have to share this. My grandmother, Rosa, my father's mom, was an actress when she was young, in high school. At that time, I don't know if that was true in other countries, but at that time in Puerto Rico, at least, I'm talking about the beginning of the 20th century, girls and boys could not be on stage together. So if there was a play, the girls would be playing boys and boys, you know, and mm -hmm. girls, and they, they were boys that were like that. And so they were doing um, Don Juan Tenorio, the, the classical, the classic play, Spanish play, Don Juan. And she was given the role of Don Juan. And she was so excited. And the, the teacher, teacher director said, well, you need a short hair. And she had long hair. And she said, okay. So she goes to her mom and she says, I need to cut my hair very short like a boy. And you are not. I said, okay, what do I do? She runs over to the beauty parlor. She knew the person. She says, no, would you cut my hair like a boy? She said, no, without, without your mother's permission. I said, please, please, please. And this woman went ahead and cut her hair short. It what used to be called a boy, a boy cut for girls. Um, and she gets home and it was disaster. Screaming, my grandfather great-grandfather told her, you can't do that. You're not gonna do that play. You're not gonna be a boy. You're not gonna cut your hair. You're ready to cut your hair. We're going, and he went to the principal, and he said, and he was an influential man, and he said, you have to stop the production. My daughter is not going on that stage with that short hair of being uh, as a boy. And principal said, but we already have guests. The announcements are out. I mean, he says like, so my father swallowed his pride, and he said, okay, we'll make it happen. And you know, all I have to say, oh, in short, my grandmother for the rest of her life never let her hair grow back. Wow. She always, she was the only woman in town who had short hair. When the, all, all the women at that time would wear the moños, the Spanish moños and all that. And with her, and I, all I, the, the last image I have of her is bedridden when she was very old. And my two aunts, every time the hair would grow like that, my two aunts would just cut it to make sure it kept short out of respect for her. So you all you see on my fam family's pictures are everyone with their long hair. I mean, grandmother with her short hair. It was like her defiance. She was saying, I'm my own, my own woman. And I always remember, to me, that was like the first sort of leadership um, lesson I learned okay. from someone in my family. So that rebel bug, like with your father, yeah. runs deep in the lineage. I, I try to keep it in check. <laughs> <laughs> That is great. So, uh, so you've had major uh, performing arts influential figures in your family, who have also helped you out there. Yes, I mean they were not like professional. It was just that the arts and it was just part of the day, every day okay. life. Sometimes I remember, um, I remember like if we were gonna have dinner, my aunt or my grandfather would bring. A poem I would say, you know, let's read this poem before we. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but then you, I mean, you say no at the moment and you're like, I want to eat. And then you realize you don't know how much that goes right into your system. Mm -hmm. 
which is why it's so important that our behavior around young people be we understand how much they're observing even if we don't think they are absolutely absolutely yeah. that's that's something we all need to be conscious about because yeah. children are studying from the very beginning yeah the uh, so when you left puerto rico who did you leave behind at that time uh well i was actually in my first marriage so i left with my my husband my first husband and uh, my, my parents stay behind and my brother is he's a year younger than I am and so oh so that was yeah it was it was hard but um but um by then uh, he uh, had received a scholarship and that was a trigger actually I was not that ready to move to New York but he received a, a fellowship to come and study and finish his graduate work and I since I had been in New York the year before it was like yeah I want I want to do that I have been to New York when I was 17 in a whole completely different context, artistic concept, uh, context, and we can talk about that later. Um, but um, so that was the reason I, 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 I moved, and, and but I left my entire family behind. And, uh, and there were no cell phones, so the call to New York was considered long distance call, so they were expensive, and so, so you know, to keep that connection was, was hard. But I did it, yeah. Wow, and um, so when you moved here to New York City, what neighborhood did you first move to? Well, believe it or not, a neighborhood that it could probably, many of us could never live today because it's out of our, of our reach. I lived on 71st Street and West End Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> where, where it's almost impossible, right? To uh, yes, I but, would agree. But that's because that's because um, when I had come, the I had been there the year before. The university had us in what was sort of like the Airbnb of the time, at the time, which was this hotel, small hotel that on Seventy First Street that would house students, like graduate students, and they had an arrangement with the university. So that's the neighborhood I knew. And so when that program continued, that's where we were living. And then when the program ended, uh, an apartment was, you know, available next door, and, and, and I moved there. But it became increasingly expensive and almost impossible to sustain. Um, and then I moved over to um, Washington Heights to Hillside Avenue after that. Okay. And I read somewhere when you first came here, you worked in the social work field. Could you yes. tell us a little bit about that? I know. Well, the thing is, believe it or not, even though I had performed, I mean, I knew that I wanted to do theater and or dance because that dance was also a big part of modern dance, big part of my training. And I also a music and I played a very unconventional instrument. A national secret. <laughs> <laughs> Actually. So I played the accordion. Okay. That's the instrument I learned when I was nine years old all the way through. And then when it became unsexy to play the accordion and, and it was embarrassing to have, you know, that's the moment when you're 17 and you're trying to flirt and you're playing the accordion. You don't do those things. So I stopped. I stopped the accordion. <laughs> no more accordion for me. <laughs> but um, but the reason I, I I mentioned that is because that I I got used to going to school, and then my uh, my own after school practice was not in school, but it was going to the dance class, going to the accordion class, going to you know. So that's. So I never thought of it as a profession, but as something that I was doing all the time. Now, when I mentioned going to the Luis Valles Matos Middle School, I mentioned that because that was the first time that I, the, the idea of theater was triggered for me. That program of the University of, of, of the, I'm sorry, of the Department of Education in Puerto Rico, Arte en la Comunidad, um, would bring um, classics and all kinds of shows to the classrooms, not even to a school auditorium necessarily. So I remember watching a whole classical play in my classroom for 25 students. We would pull the, the chairs back and, and we would sit on the floor 
for an hour and a half and have these people perform these very complicated plays, you know, a classical plays right in front of them. And saying, oh my goodness, this is just so amazing. That's, the, that's when the first thing of theater as a future entered my mind, but still in high school, I kept thinking, because you're also pushed by society to think otherwise, you know, you have to have these other professions that are gonna be your security rather than the arts, right? Um, in high school, I really went into the theater program they were offering us as an after school. I performed uh, lead plays, uh, lead characters uh, at, the, at the school and also at the local town theater, at the Guaynabo Theater, um, as part of the, like a school plays. I would really, when it came to high school, I thought I really would love to go to the Department of Drama or School of Drama at the University of Puerto Rico, but still, I loved psychology, I loved social work, I love it. So it wasn't really social work as much as education and psychology and human behavior. And I don't know why I went for that. And I, I found myself at the universities at the social science, uh, faculty of social sciences, studying um, sociology and living at the end of the day where to, to my dance class, and to my music class, and to my theater class. So I, to me, was always that extra thing. And I, for some reason, it, you know, it didn't, it didn't, um, I didn't feel passionate enough to enter the Department of Drama in full, but rather to continue with that art of experiences outside of the university. And that my master's was also in that, you know, um, psychological counseling, and, which actually are fields that are very useful to me as a director and as a writer today. Uh, and I thought at some point after I graduated, I said, I, I have, I have, I've got to make the decision. And um, I want to say that, that for a while there was a very weird movement, musical movement around the world called the Viva La Gente or Sing Out. It was a moral rearmament conservative movement, but when it got to Puerto Rico, we all just wanted to sing and dance, so we didn't care what it was. He said, let's, so I joined that, and I, we were just singing everywhere, and that's when we came to New York for the first time, um, for summer, to get training, and so it, I, I don't know what got into me, that I just went into a different field. So I came to New York, and my, once I was established, the first year or so, my my inclination was I have to find a job. I have we have to make a living while uh, my my former husband was in school and, and even though there was a fellowship, and I said oh, I'll look work in social work field because that seems the most fitting. And a friend a friend of mine uh, introduced me to this agency who actually connected me with a beautiful, actually beautiful uh, organization called St. Joseph's Children's Services in Brooklyn. Okay. And I was hired to do their, uh, be their education uh, coordinator for the youth in foster homes. And what did I do the moment I got that position? Was I cre I invented a talent show? <laughs> and I began to to, take, to find ways to do creative stuff with the young people. And the agency was open enough to institute that. And I was very I was very grateful. And, but I, would, I had a void in my life and I had to pursue what I needed to pursue. And, um, and my life, you know, our personal life went in a different direction and, and um, I was able to, then I was told that there was this place, this was 1970, like two years after, after I was here. This place um, in, in the Lower East Side that, that had these theater classes. Uh, and I went there, and the teacher was an actress, Puerto Rican actress that I admired from Puerto Rico. And she was a great actress, very well known, and she had moved to New York temporarily. Um, by then, I had moved to, 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 to Hillside Avenue and 194th Street. And I, um, I had finished my master's, I had my degree, I was recently separated, I had a life. But I had made a decision that I really wanted to do this, but it was so hard, it was so difficult. 
that I found myself without money, without, without you know, really without any resources to, to live my life. I, you know, I was entering a, a really dangerous line of poverty at some point. And that's when uh, everything sort of began to happen at once. Uh, the I was going to the to those to those classes uh, at, at, at Sopolsk Street, but today we know as the beautiful Clemente Sotovelles Cultural Arts Center on Suffolk Street. Uh, and uh, but then it was it was a school that had been um, that had been acquired to to for immigrants. It was the first university uh, for immigrant students and it was beautiful because we had students from everywhere, from all over Latin America that were trying to obtain their, their college degrees and they could go through these programs and actually do it. It was there, it had technology, it had all kinds of things and I was hired to work on sort of like their uh, job training program while I was attending the theater courses and eventually everything gravitated and I just ended up doing the theater uh, there. And, but it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. And then, but I found my, and then that's when my teacher, Elianit Cadilla is her name, she's still active. She said to me, Rosalba, you, you have got to make a decision. You have got to make this your life because you, you, you're good at it, you're a great actress, you need to do this. Welcome back. And uh, before we stop for that break, we were talking about your, uh, and for, forgive the, the cliche, your starving artist years. <laughs> Could you please talk to us about uh, the struggles you first went through in uh, not just creating Pregones, but uh, bringing the performing arts more, you know, as a larger part of your life? And please. Yes, I, I mean, um... I have spent a good portion of my life actually trying to, I guess that was my motivation to fight against the the concept of the starving artist precisely because it is very real. Um, I had made a decision and I had to live with it. I, I thought, you know, um, guided by the, this gr group of people I was meeting in my theater classes and my and, 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 and the, my mentor and I'm thinking, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, and uh, here, but what am I doing? Here I am with a master's degree, with some, you know, with um, experience in this agency that I'm working with, and, and, but this is what I really need to do with my life. And I was 24, 25, I said, I have no time to waste. And I, you know, I recently separated, and all, I mean, a lot of changes, and, but I just, uh, and, and actually while um, do, going to these courses at, uh, at Suffolk Street at the center, um, we, uh, the, by the way, the center was called then Solidaridad Humana, uh, and then it became Clemente Soto Vélez Cultural Center. But while I was doing that, um, I began to get connected with what was then the, the lat local Latino theater movement in New York City, and I'm like, wow, there is a repertory, there is a repertory español, there is Puerto Rican traveling theater, very young or very young theaters then, there is Intal. Uh, they were, you know, formed five years ago, six years ago, they already have a theater or, you know, a small what, uh, venue, and and I began to, to flirt with the idea of, of even though my first professional job here was not in Latino theater, it was at the Ensemble Studio Theater. But this is what I really wanted to do, to connect with, with the community that I was just getting to know. Um, and, and I did that, I, I began to audition, I found out how to do that. I had no idea how to do that. Uh, and then I began to work, you know, um, with um, with these theaters, actually, first with what was then um, uh, Teatro Dume, eventually became Thalia Spanish Theater in Queens, but before they were in Manhattan, 
um, I met the amazing Rene Bush, who was, who was the artist director of Repertorio Español, but I had yet to meet Miriam Colon. I had not met her yet. I was wanting to, but I didn't know how to go about that. Um, and I knew that she was getting a new space. This was in, again, 1975, 76. I said, that is the life I want to live. Somehow I'm in New York City and um, and then reality set in, you know, I, I now I'm alone, I have to pay my rent, I have to do this, I have to do that. And I was looking for jobs everywhere and I couldn't find them. And um, at that time, there was this film that we all know about called For the Apache that was being filmed. Um, there was um, a lot of protestas and, and and I began to get myself immersed in that message because that was new. I didn't know what the real New York, uh, New Yorker, Puerto Rican New Yorker, New York weekend. I mean, I, I didn't know. I was just getting my feet wet and getting to know what eventually I realized was the other side of me, right? Mm -hmm. The other side of me. The, New York and the Puerto Rican, there's just one thing, and but each with its own particular experiences. But I didn't know, I just knew that politically, I, I knew where my heart was and that I found it offensive and appalling what was happening with that film. And then I heard about the protestas, and then um, I found myself in a real financial bind. Uh, one evening, I remember, uh, my telephone was going to be disconnected the next day because I didn't have $15 to pay for it, and they took, gave me until noon the, on, on this particular Friday. I had like, a, I don't know, a potato on, a, on a, my refrigerator. The, the, the tokens, uh, the MTA, the subway tokens then, were 35 cents. I had 25 cents in my pocket. So I said, I can't even take a token to go where. I mean, it's like, just crazy. And then the telephone rings. Thursday night, um, I, I, I know exactly even how I was standing, how I took the phone, and it was someone from the Fort Apache film. This actress had bowed out in support of the protesters in the community, and they said, we film tomorrow. If you say yes, we'll set the car right now. You'll get paid right away. We need someone right now. And as I, he was talking to me, the images of what I was seeing on television and the press were filling my my head, but most importantly, my heart. And he's talking, and my tears are coming down, and I'm thinking about the potato and the onion I had in my freezer and the 25 cents and my telephone that was going to be caught the next day. And I was sobbing as I said, I cannot do this. I'm sorry. And then I hung up. And I think, am I crazy? Uh, and I, the next day, very early, seven, eight o'clock in the morning, I receive a call before my telephone is, gets cut off at noon from what became my madrina forever, Elba Cabrera, the sister of Evelina Antonetti. Elba says to me, Rosalba, what are you doing today? I said, right now, and I tell her what happened. She said, something happened. We have a, a project that we need to complete all of the stuff today. She was working at the Association of Hispanic Arts, AHA. And she said, is, is, we need to finalize some things. The person who was supposed to arrive yesterday, I don't remember where from, from another place in the United States, it's not here. I, I, I need someone, I need someone with your skills, because she knew, knew I had the skills. I need someone to come here, help us. I, and then I started to cry again. I said, Elva, I don't even have money for, for a token. Um, I, and I tell her my sob story. And she says, stay right there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick you up. We're going to go pay your phone bill. We're going to come to the office. You're going to have to work nonstop throughout midnight tonight or whatever, but you'll get paid today. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I hang up, begin to get dressed. The telephone rings again. It is 
the amazing Dr. Professor um, Seferino Carrasquillo from Lehman College, from the Puerto Rican Studies Department. She says, Rosalba, what are you doing? I said, I'm on my way, I tell you, I'm on my way to do something else. And he says, the uh, professor that was supposed to start a course on Monday has appendicitis, is in the hospital, he has, he can't do the semester at all. Can you do this? You have the master's, you have it. Because I, we had talked about it at some point, I, I had submitted, you know, but they didn't have a position for me. I said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I don't know, I don't know, I don't, you know, I always think of that, those coincidences. Um, Sometimes it does pay to do the right thing. And sometimes you do the right thing and it blows right in your face, but you still did the right thing. So I didn't know what was gonna happen with my decision the night before. But all I know is that people are respected that I, programs that I love, like the Association of Hispanic Arts, and Lima College. And, um, and then I was on my way to a rebirth in a way to to be on you know on my own terms and then that that was 1977 I believe it was when um, I made uh, uh, for a year or two or a year or so but the beautiful thing is that once I took that step out the door of my apartment to go into the life that I wanted I never looked back I taught at Lehman for 10 years they were beautiful 10 years um, and and at with the Association of Hispanic Arts, that's when I get going to that office that was a CETA program at the time, and all of these artists were working under this federal program, and I begin to meet, they were part of me, the artists who were born here, who were raised here, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, we, like we're different, but we're not, and that is when I begin to discover whole world. And in that world, I begin to meet the directors of the then of the, the leading Latino theaters at the moment, right, um, in New York. And the, my first task after I did the job that day, and it did t take us until midnight, I don't remember what it was, um, they said, we're gonna do a meeting, we're gonna organize a meeting of all the artistic directors of the theaters here at AHA, the offices. So you're in charge of organizing the meeting, bring them here. And I'm sitting with a friend and telling them what we're doing, and and, and I said, and, and I, I have working with these artistic directors and I still have to call Miriam Colon. He said, you're gonna to talk to Miriam Colon, you're gonna meet Miriam Colon. And I still, I knew about Miriam and her importance, but I didn't know yet the magnificence of a Miriam Colon. I was just like, oh yeah, because it was Hilbert Saldiva, it was Max Ferra. Uh, it was all this amazing, Margarita Toidar, Mario Peña, all of them. I said, okay, uh, uh, yeah, I'm gonna meet her. And, and then we did the meeting. I can't even tell you where each one was sitting down, but Miriam, Miriam was just so eloquent and so special and so important for all of us. And and then I was working, and then I, that's when I told them, they asked me what I was doing. I said, I'm an actress, I will, he said, would you want to audition for us? And that's when I began to make these connections. And I began to audition and I began to get hired immediately. I worked with uh, with Mario and Margarita uh, Toidak and I worked at, uh, uh, with, with uh, Dume as well and I had not worked with Miriam yet. It's very interesting. While working with uh, Alberto Dume, the, the director, um, he uh, he and Silvia, the late, both of them are deceased now, but late Silvia Brito acquired what is today Italia Spanish Theater in, uh, in Queens. And I remember that they were doing this amazing production with a director that was my childhood uh, hero as an actor. I mean, Raul Davila. When I called my mother, I said, I'm going to audition for Raul Davila. She almost fainted because she knew how much <laughs> I admired. That's like, audition for Raul Julia or Raul, you know, it's like, oh my God. And I got the part. And I got the part. <laughs> and I have the picture still. Um, and that was the beginning of nonstop working in our theaters. And I had met Miriam, but there was still it was not an opportunity for me to audition for some reason, for, you know, for whatever reason, with the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater. She, she was also just beginning to open 
the space and, and they did. They were, you know, uh, doing all the renovations needed, etc. And it all happened so fast between 77 and 79 that I thought, I love this place that I'm doing, but I feel that we're doing enough for the weekend place. I would love, because I'm still a recent immigrant. I still had that fire that I brought from the island that I wanted to, to show what I knew. Uh, and, and I spoke with my two colleagues and friends who were in the production, Luis Melendez and David Cromet. And I said, you know, since we're working together, we get along, let's start something. Why don't we do a little something just for us? And now, I had been very influenced by the whole journey of Teatro Popular, Latino Americano, political theater. And I think that is what was missing in me, that I still needed, wanted to do a bit more political kind of theater in my own head and heart. And they say, yeah, why don't, let's, those things that you talk about with friends, let's do something and let's, I don't know, let's invite five friends and let's, you know. Um, and I did. And, and we began to talk about what? And in one of my malacrianzas and one of my uh, rebellious moments, they said, what would you do? I said, what would I do? I, I want to do a hundred years of Puerto Rican theater. You want to do 100 years of Puerto Rican theater? They look at me like I was crazy. I said, well, not exactly, but what if we were to start researching and figuring out what has been done over the years? Mm -hmm. We ended up with the concept in which we were going to read all of these plays and we were going to take two or three plays from each decade, from 1989 to 1979, or 1879 to 1979, or something like that, 78. Um, and and we're gonna just have those plays. And they said, well, you're gonna, you still have like uh, 30 plays that you're going to do. So, well, no, okay, how about if we take the most important climatic scene from each play and we put them all together? And we still have like 30 scenes. Well. To summarize, we ended up choosing one per decade and ended up with 10 amazing, 10, 100 years, amazing climatic scenes from a play from each decade. And we put them all together in something called La Colección, the collection. And that was the first, um, and called a few friends. Uh, we invaded a theater that we're not, we were not supposed to be invading. In other words, the boyfriend of one of the actresses <laughs> that we invited to work with us. This is what we're doing on the side while we were doing this other place. Um, he said, you know, the theater, I'm a custodian of this theater and it's dark on Mondays. <laughs> and I said, okay, he says, do you want to go in there so you have an actual theater to do something in? Well, is it safe? I mean, can we do it? He said, well, no one is going to know. So we completely, completely and radically invaded this place. Invited like 50 friends. And Miriam K came. Very VIPs came. They all knew they were there illegally. <laughs> that we were not supposed to be there. And um including great, I mean, like Emilio Carvallido, one of the biggest Mexican writers and directors. I mean, everyone was there like, okay, let's do this fast and then we have to leave. <laughs> and we did it. And we read our, uh, and we did it. And we used recorded music. And when we did the, the, we didn't even have a name. We just said, you know, we're going to do this as a test. And when we, finished, uh, Don Emilio Carvallido said, I love this, but what business do you have using recorded music when you have such amazing musicians in the Puerto Rican community? You People can take, make uh, music out of a, of, a, of a bang in a can. I mean, why can't you? I'm like, okay, Don Emilio, okay. And that was our first challenge. Someone challenged us to use live music. 
and then our search began for musicians who would don't, wouldn't mind working with a bunch of actors, and we did find. So that was the seed. That was the seed. Today, 40 something years later, someone tells me, what if someone invented your space? Do that. I said, well, if it's to create something as beautiful as we have, I don't mind. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was that was that was that moment, but we still didn't think of a company. We just wanted to be to do something creative while we were doing this other thing, while we were re working in, in all these productions. And that's when I received a, a call from Miriam. Already the, the theater had, had been built and her office was on the second floor. Today we have a gallery in her honor in that office. Uh, and I sat there with her and she said, listen, uh, you know, I need someone to work with us. I love what you're doing with the with the, I still had my part-time job with the Association of Hispanic Arts with Elba. And, um, you know, he, uh, she said it would be great if you could join us and try to do outreach because we're going to the streets, we're working outdoors. I said, oh, Miriam, I love it. But I worry because we're rehearsing this thing where I'm starting my own little company. It's not even a company, but we're, this is what we're doing. And she said to me, I will never interfere with that. Count on me. Don't do this job that I'm offering you because you're going to be trapped on a desk, in a desk. Count on me. While I'm talking to Miriam, I hear these stumps on the fourth floor. I said, what is that? She said, oh, that's a, that's a theater class, uh, dance movement theater class. And I said, oh my goodness, yes, yes. They said, they, uh, we have a great director. His name is Alban Colon, the spirit of Puerto Rico. My husband of 40 years now. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't get to see him that day. I said, oh, okay, but and I left. And our lives, uh, intertwined later, a couple of years later, actually, when when our company was actually becoming, I remember, I remember when the, the, David and Luis and I sat around the table in my apartment. He said, listen, we have this, we have invitations from Princeton University to do that collection, we have invitations. It seems that we have a company, and I remember just locking hands, the three of us holding hands, saying we have a company. We don't have a name, but we have a company. Um, and that was the beginning of what we understood to be a company of touring artists, um, uh, uh, doing guerrilla work in a way, just, just going to corners and a anywhere we could go. We did not want to have a space. <laughs> now we have two, two theaters. Uh, we did not want, I, it was about, it was about bringing, it sounds cliche, but it was about bringing theater to the people, which is the principle that Miriam had built, built on uh, mm -hmm. in her theater and Repertorio Español as well, I remember, because Roberto and Miriam used, Miriam used to work together. And we get, and again, Elba tells me, my sister, Evelina Antonetti, uh, is the director of United Bronx Parents. I had not heard of United Bronx Parents then, talking 1979. And then that's when the journey begins. And once Evelina saw what we were doing, she began to plug us into the various, various organizations in the Bronx that we found ourselves immersed. I still was learning. I was still culturally learning this world that was called New York and this world that I felt that I didn't belong to. And I wanted to belong to. But I couldn't assume it as my own because it wasn't. So it was, it's, it's a light journey to feel that this is me, that my daughter is the, is the New York woman. That, you know, everything, all that, but it takes years and years of real honest work and relationships. And, and, and so once we began, uh, in time, we, you know, as time went by, uh, we found we, we said a lot of names <laughs> of pregones because uh, in Spanish, the word uh, in English, pregones means the chants of the street vendors. And we felt that that's what we were because we were doing companies solely going from city to city to places where there was little 
or no formal organized arts centers or groups. And our role was to try to inspire the locals to create their own initiatives. And, and, and some of our, our first, actually, our first presenters everywhere were the associations of, um, of Puerto Rican students or Latino students in the various universities. They said, we are, you know, we have to form this association. They would ask for an auditorium. They would never give us the, the main theater to perform. We perform whatever they told us to perform, the cafeteria, the backs, you know, whatever. Um, our touring experience is, a, is subject for another, for a whole other history project, yes. but um, because to this day, at last count, we have toured and or worked with in um, uh, 537 cities in the United States, 38 states, and 18 countries. And, and in some Amazing. of the cities, we went again and again and again. Some of the cities, we spent a year going back every two weeks for a year. And so it, it all, you know, it, 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 was, it has different configurations in a way. But um, we found ourselves in the Bronx immersed now with Evelina, who was amazing, who um, get, we did some workshops there and at the United Prosperity Office. Then eventually she, she said, this is a desk and that's a phone, just make it yours. And we would like, you know, tell, we'll give that number to people. It's hello, Pregones Theater. <laughs> and we were in another corner in the desk of, uh, of United Transparency and Evelina was just amazing. And, and so we became very familiar with the Bronx Council of the Arts in that process. And, as, and I want to say also that before that, we had already, Alvan had already, then we, we were together and he joined, he joined the company. And, but, but we were also working in Harlem at the, what was then Teatro Cuatro. It's another former firehouse like we have now, mm -hmm. like we have not now, but like Miriam did uh, with, with uh, Puerto Rican Trumpet Theater on 104th Street. And I remember that we used to work there while we were doing all of our educational work in, in the Bronx and trying to understand the borough, trying to feel part of it and, and falling in love with it every moment until one day, uh, Bill Aguado, who was then the executive director of, for, for years he was executive director and, and of the Bronx Council of the Arts, said to me, Rosalba, you know, we have the Longwood project, the arts project, this big building in, in, on Longwood Avenue. And you know, if you want to establish an office in the Bronx, it would be great if, and it was like, oh my God, you know, to have our own little space, an office where we could have like a real, you know, a real equipment and, and actually like classrooms. Therefore, we would occupy a corner and we could rehearse at the rest of the space. And when I went there for the first time, I remember that moment on the Luis Pales Mato School, where they would bring entire productions to a classroom. And I'm thinking, this is a classroom, just like when I was in seventh grade. Yes, we can rehearse here. Yes, we can rehearse the whole production and then take it to places. And for the first time we had like a real place. And when we find out, find ourselves there immersed with that, immersed with that is Bronx Paris, in the, immersed with uh, a very progressive church uh, uh, rector, Father Roberto Morales, uh, St. Margaret's Church would take us there to do our shows and the children's programs. Um, is when we said we are, our stories are still, our stories from the island, only stories for the island. This is important, but I feel that we miss something. We're incomplete. The other side of me, the other side of me is not in the room. And that's when we, we said we had, we have to open this up. And, 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 and we did at the first, the first uh, New York actor to to come and audition for us. That was 1982, 83. Maybe, I don't know, around there. We, we, we moved to that office in 1983. This was Jose Garcia, who performs with us today. 30, so 38 years later. <laughs> 
And he opened up the doors for so many other artists, Judith Rivera. And it's just that we became the family where today we see the mix now beyond our Puerto Ricanness of the United Nations of Latin America here, you know, of uh, Domin Dominicans and Cubans and Venezuelans and Colombians and um, everywhere. I mean, it's just, this is, it's home for so many as it should be. So, and so those were the beginnings, how we took our touring model to make sure uh, that we had what eventually we said, we have very, very deep roots, but we also have wings, and, and that was our first formal space, even before we had our first theater. Our very first venue was the result of our relationship with United Bronx Paris and the St. Margaret's Church here in the Bronx. Uh, the um, the um, rector of St. Margaret's was the, uh, Father Roberto Morales, who is a former professional basketball player. And that's important for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> that he was a basketball player before he became um, an Episcopalian um, rector of a, of a very progressive church that he led. He was um, sent or he was changed from, transferred, I should say, from St. Margaret's to St. Saint Saint Anne's Church, historic St. Anne's Church, on a hundred, near 140th Street on St. Anne's Avenue. And um, that is a beautiful, beautiful church that has a, its own um, private graveyard where where some historical figures are buried even. And it had a beautiful uh, gene-like that would have made a great basketball court. And we thought that's what Father Roberto Morales is gonna do, but he had fallen in love with our work. And he said, you know, our summer program is gonna address sports and all that in the summer because during the school year is harder. So we're gonna use outdoors, the outdoors uh, bus, uh, court that they had. And we have this gym, you can just come here and rehearse here and, and uh, so that you don't, are not constrained in your uh, classroom style office, which was still very, very useful. And that's where we built everything for a couple of years. We're talking 1983 around. We were traveling like crazy. We were traveling a good 50 to 60% of the year, either locally in the local communities and around the country and in uh, festivals around the world, Europe, Latin America. And um, he, um, we said, okay, I mean, it's great because that way we can do our, you know, we, we can do our dance uh, uh, workshops and all kinds of things that we were doing at the time. Thank you so much. He said, just go in there. One thing led to the other. And he said, well, why don't you put, put chairs and you can perform and invite people? I'm thinking, well, that's like having a theater. We're, we're, we're a touring company. Um, and and he kept flirting with us, and we kept falling for it. <laughs> Eternally grateful, one thing led to the other, and one day, day we, we sat down, really, and he said, listen, I know it's like three or four of you only, but you're growing, and he, he could even see, see, see things that we didn't acknowledge, or, or if we saw them, we didn't acknowledge this. We are growing. We're everywhere, you know, we, we have, you know, we have, we, is this a theater company? This is, has to go, you know, we have to figure it out. And um, before we knew it, then we said, okay, let's, let's start there. Let's just bring in some chairs and let's do something and see if people come. He is such a progressive leader uh, under the, you know, on the bottom floor of the church. Of the, of the gym was a, uh, a whole service office for health and well-being, especially because the AIDS crisis was hitting our community very hard. And so there were orientations and there were things where people did not want to deal with AIDS or people felt like, you know, the homophobia and everything that was, that was so 
tragic. Um, he addressed it directly by opening a space for the community to come and talk about it and receive services. Uh, there were quite a few political prisoners at the moment, Puerto Rican political, and he had a service for the families uh, of the, the prisoners. I mean, it was like incredible. Mm -hmm. And he says that now we're going to have a theater. So this is not going to be a theater, Father. This is going to be us rehearsing. Remember, we toured. Uh, the thought of having a space was scary. And he said, well, okay, let's, let's try. And when we began to invite audiences, people began to come in in large quantities. And we thought, oh, my God. <laughs> and... Uh, the, the word spread out in the community that we were opening a theater as in as church. <laughs> and we get an, a knock on our door one day, and was this, this man who said, hello, my name is Gino Donovan, and I am the director, president of Hudson City Studios. We are a Broadway uh, stage set building company, and we have our company like four blocks down. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that. That's where we build all the major Broadway sets like Cats and Rent and all that. We heard you were opening the theater. We have all of these things that we don't use and that these productions don't use. Do you mind if we help you build your theater? <laughs> wow. I think if you look behind a couple of those, or and they will have another one downstairs, you still have the curtains that say, say Cats stamped on the back. Oh, wow. He, they showed up and they basically built the, the framework for our theater, for our stage, for our curtains, for our dressing room, for free, as a donation. Wow. And that put us in a situation where we then now were becoming ambitious. We said, oh my God, we do have a space. But it could still use more theatrical setup and they helped us identify a theater architect, Richard Kurtz, and we went for the money and we asked the city for help and people came through and we were able to have a fully designed theater um, via a theater architect and then Hudson Cinic Studios helping us. They're still doing the marvelous sets that we see and they just this year, 30, almost 40 years after, just built our set down at the new production that you're, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's coming up. That we just did and, 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 and the one that is coming up. So they have remained friends. But what I'm saying is that people believe in your mission, the sense of mission. We, we had, we had the reputation of this Puerto Rican company, Puerto Rican based company and Puerto Rican company and now expanding with our other side of us, right? And infusing our New York and voices into our lives and, and, and trying to, you know, working through all of the, all of the details and, and, and nuances of identity and culture and see, still seeing that we're part of a larger world as well. So we, when we inaugurated our theater since 1985, we said, but now what? We're gonna be traveling a lot, but this space is here. So now we have a space for other artists. And we organized our first international festival and we began, we, our relationships that we had been developing for at least a good then, a good 10 years before that, or nine years before that, in other parts of the world, we began to invite those groups from, from you know, from Mexico and from Peru and from Venezuela, and from uh, Dominican Republic, in addition to Puerto Rico, of course. And, and, and we began to be, get plugged in uh, to the various networks of the industry in the country. And we began to see ourselves, in addition to being this touring company and have this space in the Bronx and all of the significance of having a theater, that theater in the Bronx at the time. Um, then other networks began to invite us to come to this conference, let's join us, become mm -hmm. members. And so we began to develop um, a very formal approach to doing the business. And we 
I remember we were still holding several jobs because we, our salaries were still, you know, and our focus was making sure the artists would get paid. And I remember when, when uh, one of the foundations came to visit and, and, and they said, uh, all right, so we are gonna come through with at least a couple of years of general operating support so you can have your salaries and all that. This was 1984 around there. And we said, okay, we need the salaries, but then we made what I think was a very wise decision. We need an administrative structure. We need to have an, an in-house accountant. We need to have an administrator. And that's when we um, hired um, our uh, two people that if you go downstairs right now, they're still with us. We hired Maggie Gonzalez and James Figueroa were the first two people that we hired. Maggie was just starting and she's now uh, obviously a senior staff member. And James uh, was starting his business as an accountant and he's now our, uh, they're both here today. Wow. <laughs> All this year before, because we do believe in this, you know, the provide the environment that will make people feel safe and stable. And, and then we began to realize that we were part of a much larger world I didn't know we had been touring so much, but in terms of these more the professional networks, the you know we were involved. Alvan was involved in the creation of the um, um, uh, National Performance Network that was initially at the Dance Theater Workshop, and then we began to know the Dance Theater Workshop and all of these institutions. And I remember we said, you know, I went to Miriam. I said, we're going to open the theater. We want to want you to be an honoree, and I she was the, the first honoree when we opened the theater. I remember, um, and and our friendship just got grew stronger and stronger and stronger, and and we were now really had like this is going on an express lane and a local lane in a way, you know. We had this life on the road, and then we had this local lane that we had to nurture and 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 grow, um, and that's. We were as an ass for 10 years almost. And uh, then uh, Father Roberto Morales left and, and the new administration was not as sure as that they needed to have the theater there. And we said this, you know, obviously things were not the way they were before. And I think in a way we also recognized that we probably wanted some more independence at that point since Roberto wasn't there anymore. And so we parted ways and we put everything on, a, and, and I remember calling the, um, the point was, was starting at okay. that time, universes where some of the theaters that worked with us mm -hmm. and that when they were starting with, they performed with us and everything at that stage. And they were building the theater and we said, listen, rather than put all these seats that we had beautiful seats that Hosan Cynic had brought us, mm -hmm. all those seats in the storage, do you want them since you're building a theater? And I believe they still have them. Wow. Um, and we began to give things away because we thought, why put it in the storage when we don't know exactly what's going to happen next? And we had a year of touring that was just growing and growing. And we opened a small theater on Grand Concourse and, and a small theater, an office. But of course, having had, having tasted, having had the taste for this uh, venue, um, there was a space made, made half of this stage of our theater and we said why don't we put like 30 chairs and still do a little studio and we said we, we needed now to have our own space but the beautiful thing is that our move from St. Anne's coincided with Hostos College opening their beautiful theaters and we had a you know some money that we had been able to get a for rental of a space, and we talked to Wally Etchcom, who was the director of, for so many years, he retired recently, um, a few years ago, and we said, you know, we'll rent the theater to do a production, and we were their first rental, and he was so happy. <laughs> so we became like family, and eventually, he was host us, the host of our Mountain to Mind Mountain project that we had with our friends in the Appala and the Appalachians um, with Rosite Theater and, and with the many other guests that we had uh, from all over, you know, from different cultures, because we always believe that it's um, multiculturalism. I mean, it just becomes, it becomes, uh, it becomes a uh, sort of template language, you know, multicultural is like, it doesn't mean anything anymore for right. some people, but it, 
it is a very meaningful concept. You know, it's cross cultures, it's multicultures, hitting it together on one stage, and and, and we have been doing that for for, for decades. And um, so, and then while we were at Grand uh, Concourse of that studio, Miriam and I began to talk about. You know, because she has, she was beginning to look at her at the last phase of her work, mm -hmm. you know, retirement and all that. And she said, Rosalba, oh, maybe we can we can fuse some of our pro projects, like the summer tour, for example, that we would do, because we continue to work on the streets in addition to having the theater and, and, and touring. And we said, absolutely, let's do something. And we began to 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 merge some of our programs uh, of our offerings together. Those were the first steps. It was like a strategic alliance at first. It was not mm -hmm. a merger. It was about let's fuse resources. You know, we can share some stuff. We can share space. And she had the theater, so we could do things there while we were developing our little 35, I think the 35 seats or 46 studio. Um, and then we opened our little studio, and it was always full because it was only like 40 seats or something like that. Uh, but by then we knew that we were using that time to find a permanent place of our own. And so the owner of that building, when we told him what we wanted to do, he said, I have this building that's really in bad shape. It's sort of abandoned. I saw Malton Avenue. It has had many iterations. It has been a daycare center. It has been an archival place for hostels. It has, it's, but the last people who were there basically destroyed it and have curse words sprayed all over the walls. I mean, you have no idea. They said this was like all the tumbling walls inside. Wow. We said, okay, but you don't know what it means to work with an artist. I tell everyone, give us your, give me your ugliest building. We're gonna turn it around. Wow. Artists will do that until the end of time. And we saw it. And I remember we came and this my musical director who you, you just met came here we just touched the walls we came in we could not go all the way back here because everything was in like in ruins and right. it was dangerous so we just went downstairs we said okay we want it <laughs> I don't know what got into us <laughs> and we had a house that doesn't is not there anymore because we demolished it to, to build a new building because mm -hmm. it was not viable anymore but it had a house next to it I said what if we pull our operations to the small house and um, turned this into a theater. I said, I don't know what we were thinking, but we brought we brought some engineers and we called Mitchell back, who had, mm -hmm. you know, the architect, and they poked with some magical things they have, and they said, this, the structure is good. And we said, okay. And that's when we did our first step to um, approach uh, our Ben Mora president uh, and uh, and our Congress and Congress uh, member Serrano, and um, and we brought uh, Adolfo Carrion here, the, the board president at the moment. And and I remember I, I, I teased him because he was just here the other day, and he was downstairs and we're thinking about everything we're gonna do, and he's looking at this building, who is <laughs> <laughs> in such bad shape, and he's going okay. But to his credit and the credit of the public officials, they all believed in our mission and our vision for the building. Um, and and they came through so that we could purchase it and that we could uh, build it, and, you know, uh, make a beautiful theater out of it. Um, and I remember being outside with, with uh, Adolfo one day, and he said, what is your biggest dream? And at that moment, these two kids, in their 40, 50 years old with the backpacks after school were walking by, I said, my dream is that those two kids when they're 30 or 40 years old will say, I grew up coming to that theater. That's and they awesome. will bring their kids. Wow. And that's happening. I, we have people all the time here saying, I grew up coming here and these are my kids. I want them to know this theater. And that, so anyway, that's how we built this and, and how we continue to, to to build our touring program in a different format because the, the responsibility of having this is different. We couldn't be on the road. Also, the same ensemble, because that's the other thing. I haven't talked really about our artistic format. Mm -hmm. Pregones Theater was made as an, created as an ensemble. 
continues to be an ensemble of various generations. Some are active, some are not, but they're always part of the family. Some are alumni. We, we bring in new people. They become part of the ensemble. It's not only the actors, it's the designers, the production crew, everybody who becomes part of that family that creates work. And I mention that uh, because part of it is that we continue to get great um, energy from branching out and continuing to travel and work with other communities. And we go back to places that we were in, uh, work with 30 years ago. You know, we just finished a, 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 a project in uh, Bethlehem with Touchstone Theater in Bethlehem in Pennsylvania. Now, with the first time we performed in Bethlehem was in 19, uh, it was 35 years ago, I think, 34, 36 years ago. And, and we're back giving workshops to the children or grandchildren of people who saw us then. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, now we're more intentional about how we tour because we have obligations at, here at home. And then that oh, those, those responsibilities grew when uh, some five years ago, or well, into the 2014, 2015, it became evident that Miriam could not be, you know, she, her health was not great. And she said, I, I can't imagine anyone else with this baby of mine except Pregones. And that's when we decided to merge into one institution. So from me being totally starstruck 40 years ago to having this woman tell me, please, this is, this is for you all. And, and we did it, and we were with her to the, her last moment, and um, went with her to get her presidential medal from uh, President Obama. That was a be beautiful day. And, um, and then now we are one. We are one with two venues, and we continue to venture out into the world as much as we can, and we are able to. But also, some of those relationships throughout our touring life yielded some permanent permanent friendships you know we have been we have a very large national family and we're very proud of that that's great wow i've learned so much um do you think we can speak about i know i've, I've heard you mention a few times about the two parts of you <laughs> you know and I, I guess that would be the old puerto rico <laughs> and the your new eurekanness that you've developed can, can you speak upon how, uh, say, maybe your new developed New Yorkanness or New Yorkan uh, culture uh, complements your Puerto Rican culture and the challenges? I realize <laughs> it's very interesting because I'm organizing my own documents as I arrive at a point in my life when I need to summarize my life in, in other ways. And I just found something, and I thought about about you, and I, I yeah. might still send it to you. Um, a reflection I wrote a few years ago, when I was, where I was saying, I know. I remember Mariposa. Mariposa's poem, "I didn't grow up in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico grew up in me," or something like that. I may be misstating her her beautiful mm -hmm. line. Uh, and I think that's what happened, that the Bronx grew in me. And I have little patience for anyone who, <laughs> who mistreats the, the, the borough. Uh, New Yorkanness grew up in me. I don't pretend to be, to have gone through what the New Yorkan community has gone through over the past 50, 60 years. I did not live through that. I lived through other things. They did not live through what I lived through. I did not live what they did. But right now, it's part of my heartbeat. It is. I, I, I will not, I will, I will, I will not tolerate, um, you know, any mistreatment of even the concept of whether that is Puerto Rican culture, because it is. Um, my daughter is New York and born here. And an opening night when I'm supposed to go on stage and I had to be taken to the hospital. And she was born there. 
and she was born and, and raised um, here in the Bronx, where I live and I have lived for the past 30 years. And you know, it gets to a point in where, where you don't where you don't rationalize it. This is just who you are, you stroll through life mm -hmm. like that. But I do say the other part of me because um, it's not one and the same and it's important that we know that our two actually, you know, if we take uh, Jose Marti's uh, poem, Who by Puerto Rico son de un pájaros las dos alas, two wings of one bird. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one heartbeat and it has these two ways or more because we have found Puerto Rican communities in places where we never thought we would find them. And they, they have those other contexts. Mm -hmm. So that we, we just have to, I, I'll say I have to, and I'm happy and comforted by the fact that my heart and my mind and my life is a, is a, is a merger, it's a, it's, a, it's a great like, combined soup of all of the best that each of us has to give to each other. And, um, and that's who I am today, have been for, for many years now. Um, and I always wanted my daughter to, to know that as well, you know. And, and, and I live happily. I mean, it's not like I'm thinking, I'm rationalizing. Is this this response that I respond the way I respond? And sometimes one thing comes out the one way, one thing comes out the other way. Because by now, I have integrated the best of everything. Well, wow. I think. Okay. Um, with all that said and all the work you've done and, and speaking about your, uh, your experiences in migrating here and, and your new Eurekan identity, how does all this kind of uh, culminate in one of your latest productions, Torched. Torched, Torched is uh, something I had been thinking about for a long time because it came about um, in actually during one of our international travels, two of them actually. But when I found, we have for many years now had a relationship with a beautiful theater company in the Slovak Republic. Um, and this particular company is um, located outside, uh, it is about three hours away from the capital of Slovakia. So as you arrive in Vienna, in Austria, because the, you know, that's the air, closest airport, and then you travel a couple of hours to Banska Bystrica, uh, which is a combination of a, a city of about 100,000 people, it's a large city, but not huge, but large enough, and, and a rural area. And so we are able to meet their different kinds of people and their artists are amazing. And so, but imagine yourself, Puerto Rican in Banska Bistriza in Slovakia, go to the hotel, give your identification so they can write it and this is the reaction. Bronx! <laughs> and I say, Bronx, oh, okay, 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 mom. Then you go to someplace else where there were this like market, open market, and a portion of the market were from rural uh, farmers in the area. And they said, oh, you visitors, you visitors. And yeah, visitors, where from? I said, New York, where? The Bronx. <gasps> the Bronx? <laughs> I said, oh, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> And then I, we go to Spain and we have the same reaction and then we go to um, Moscow and we have the same reaction. And we said, who has spread the news? Who is so powerful to spread information or misinform a whole, the whole world about what the Bronx is? And that began to, I mean, I knew that people were just, would discriminate or would just, you know, but again, we kept, we, you know, we kept to our work and, and we would always have to clarify when we toured, you know, because on the other hand, in the United States, we would tour some, 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 
tough neighborhoods that they would engage in good conversation about mm -hmm. them and, and 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 but to find myself in another part of the world talking about the Bronx with people that thought they knew what the Bronx was about mm -hmm. was a whole different <laughs> it's a whole different thing. And so when I came back from that first time and we came back from some other international travel, I said, I need to figure this out. Um, the, the entertainment industry, the, 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 the mass news media, um, Hollywood have made it a point to take the Bronx as a scapegoat for the entire country. I don't have to do I don't have to do something to validate ourselves to the world, but it, I do have to do something, feel that I have to do something to validate ourselves within our own community. Maybe the validate is not the right word, but for us to understand that we don't need that. But we better set the record straight. Because why not? It's the reputation of an entire community. That why should we just? But then I realized that I was reacting to something that many other people be, be, before me had been working and struggling against. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was my experience. But I began to read. I began to realize how many generations of Bronxites and New Yorkers and people in the Bronx and the Black community struggling and I said I need to join that chorus I need to I, I want people to know that that I understand mm -hmm. because I just live through it but I'm not the first or the only one so let me see what this is all about it so happened that last year uh, two years ago um, Decade of Fire that beautiful film by uh, Vivian Vasquez was released precisely about it so I said my intention was really to try to focus on the perpetrators, on the role of the media, on the role of the uh, Wall Street, the role of the landlords, and the role of the insurance companies in what became the decade of the fire, right? The 70s and, and the Bronx is burning. That was never said. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what we did. I, 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 but again, how do you do it? The way we do it, musical, you know, uh, funny, and and just as I say before, this my speech before every performance, any coincidence with people that are alive are intentional. <laughs> I'm not coincidental, mm -hmm. and so that's what we do. We 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 bring to life. We also honor. Uh, yeah, there were firefighters who were just not allies, but there were many who were. Mm -hmm and who risked their lives and who knew what was going on. And at least a couple of them off the record allowed us to uh, talk about it. And we create a fictional character um, to address those firefighters who were our allies and knew what was going on. Uh, again, no one just sits down and sets themselves up on fire. Just, that's not what happened. Ridiculous claims. Uh, so we're just adding to that to those voices, we don't pretend to be the only one. Just adding so that we don't let the story die. That's beautiful, and uh, you know, uh, you. I have one last question, and uh, feel free to answer that and, and go on and mm -hmm. fill in anything else you you would like to provide us. But we like to end every oral history with, what does the Bronx mean to you? What does the Bronx mean to means to me? It's home. It's where I have my little house that we adore, that we don't ever want to leave. Uh, it's, it's where my daughter grew up. It's where I lead the beautiful professional and personal life uh, with my husband, and uh, and he's part of the company as well, of course, still. Uh, where we have built this this place a destination for artists and for neighbors and and for community and i and i use the word neighbors purposefully because sometimes we say community and we don't know what it could be a lot of things but the neighborhood you know to understand who lives around us and who are my neighbors where we live up on, on 
for the working speech area over there and and it's, it's, it's an emotional destination for me, you know. Um, and it's where I grew up, not grew old, but also grew uh, personally. I matured. Um, and and it's, 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 a, it's, it's like a magical world because I, I'm constantly discovering things in the Bronx. It's like it doesn't end. Mm -hmm. Just when you think you know everything, you just go to a place where, oh my goodness, I didn't know this was here. Um, and and begin to realize the, the many, uh, yes, the many tragic lives that have been uh, lived in the Bronx, but also the, the most amazing lives that, and histories that have been built here. So I'm very, I'm very proud Bronxite by now. Uh, adopted daughter of the Bronx. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Wow. Senora Rosalba Rolon, I thank you so much for this opportunity. Oh, and thank again, you uh, for your patience as I tell <laughs> these stories. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for donating this time and this oral history to the Bronx County Archives and uh, for future researchers uh, well, this to is, study. Your work is very important. Uh, the Bronx Archives are very important. And we can find ways to help promote these archives awesome. as we go. And I think it's important that we work together in making sure that that they are a life resource. You know? Thank you. Thank you.